The tips of my raw signal twin tips peeked over the wildcat lift space, casting a green haze upon the snow below. I studied the scenery. It was a rare opportunity to experience something this pure, this natural, this real. Forward, white corrugated peaks stood amongst each other and their unique placid blue sky, each possessing their own steep bowls, consisting of narrow precipitous chutes leading into one wide and flat region decorated by the sprinkles of lean pines. Then I left. I knew there would be plenty of more beautiful things waiting me for me at my destination. Let's go, I called, leaping off the ledge of the lift space. The snow was deep, with barely any tracks to reduce my resistance. Skiing in these conditions was exhilarating. Flying through the snow, cutting around moguls and leaping off of jumps, I could feel my body growing hotter and hotter and sweating as I zipped down the glades. But it was becoming exhausting, a strenuous exact of constantly pushing both my body weight and the prodigious surface of powder forward. We veered to the left. into the woods which were stained by the tracks of one recluse gear, leaving the rest of the gladed snow to our consumption. I stopped after I entered the woods. This way, I called, signaling for my father and brother to follow. So once again, I reminded them, stay as far as you can to the left, and we'll be fine. Got it, they both nodded in agreement. Yeehaw! I shouted ecstatically. Lunging ahead, within no time I was immersed in nature that I so often become while skiing in the woods. I got into a rhythm, turning after every beautiful mogul, around every bump and stump of a tree. The fast rhythm was invigorating. I went faster and faster. Soon I was jumping off of moguls, doing 180s, doing spreaded eagles. It was just me and nature, equanimity, with no one else around. I turned too close to a tree at one point tangling my skis in the foliage and wood in the bushes at its base, hurling my body down the mountain. As my detached body plunged through the soft snow down the mountain, my skis fell off and sunk into the undisturbed snow. Finally, my descent stopped. Dad? I called. No response. Graham? No response. I waited a few minutes. All the while, I banged my neon green bee poles together. Hopefully, their flamboyant nature would seep through the thick green limber pines and Engelman spruces. Wow, I heard in the distance. This is amazing. Through the sliver of light, through the sliver of light prevailing through the trees, I could see Graham's orange snow pants. After about two minutes, we were together again. Next time I stopped, however, they did not show up. They must have gone ahead, I thought. So I continued and then finally emerged out from the woods, all alone in Snowbird, Utah. I called my dad's cell. The person you are trying to reach is not taking calls right now. Please try your call again right later, the phone informed me. I called my brother. No answer. One hour later, two hours later, three hours later. We're going back. That was absolutely miserable, my dad said, yanking off his helmet as he sat down to rest. He passive-aggressively collapsed into his cheap plastic chair, shaking our entire table as he slammed the chair into the table. Please don't make us. Give it another chance, Graham asked, occupying the only other seat next to my dad. Being around 1230, the wolf system came into play. The wolf system is a nice definition I use for what happens when the lodges are packed at ski areas. When ski areas get packed, people travel in groups, and they leave one person, the lone wolf, at the territory to defend. The territory are lunch seats. So while that one alpha lone wolf stays alone to guard the territory, everyone else goes to get the food. In our family, our father was always the lone wolf, sending his pups us to get the food. Coming over here was one of the worst skiing experiences I've ever had in my entire life, he whined. I don't think I can brush that off and continue, he continued. We gave him his food. 
Dad, please, give it a chance, I desperately implored, while rubbing my face from the other side of the table. I was itchy from my sweaty balaclava. He picked at the frozen aglet of his sweatshirt, which was beginning to fray. Fine, he said sternly. As we exited the lodge, the clean, dry air brushed against my rosy cheeks. I could feel its, its cold spreading inside my mouth as I licked my gums. It wasn't too cold or too warm, more refreshing than anything else. The line onto the Peru Green Express was not too long, and I could see it, the air's revitalizing effects on my father. What originally was a bitter grimace slowly turned to a flat face. With time, as we ascended on the high-speed Sixer, the bitter grimace, from which turned into a flat face, slowly turned into a slight smile. As we surfaced the lift, the wind rushed over the flat landing, whipping against our dry, cracked lips. A single drop of snow traced its way to my mouth. I savored it. The dense saliva lining the inside of my mouth immediately sapped up all the moisture that entered. Mineral Basin is now being opened, the LED board informed us. It read stupid messages about wind speeds and air temperatures and weather forecasts, etc. After some persistence, my brother and I convinced my father to let us go over to the other side of the mountain. Entering a cave, a nice warm breeze lingered over my body as I ruminated about the uncharted areas we were entering and what it meant for my dad. Dad might not love this, but I really need to experience this powder. I thought. As we were carried through the cave passage, we read all about the history of Snowbird. It wasn't really fascinating, and it didn't distract me from what I was really thinking about. What if Dad isn't able, and what if he's not in good enough shape to ski through all this snow? Are we going to lose these amazing conditions? What's going to happen to this opportunity? Light began to permeate through the sinuous cave, the sinuous curves of the cave. The natural light was of a brilliant brightness, blinding compared to the artificial cave light. As we approached the exit, the light grew stronger and more concentrated. We emerged from the cave, blinded by the ubiquitous powder. It was a whiteout. At the very bottom of the basin, we could see the Mineral Basin Express Quad. It was one of the only things that wasn't white in our field of vision. A tasteful aroma sauntered over to us tempting us to ski down to the beautiful, beautiful waffle shack at the bottom of the mountain. I slipped down from the ledge of the summit's base. The first few seconds of my descent were quick and pleasant. I could feel my body sink into the snow and compress the powder. As I moved forward, the cold, clean air tickled my mouth with persistence, a sign of our speed. I inhaled the fresh Utah air trying to really swallow all the air into my lungs. Up ahead, there were three or four tracks that highlighted bad areas, and hundreds of other acres of untouched, pristine powder called my name. In the distance, I could see a few clumps of trees, but the rest of my view was blessed with spectacular views of the surrounding mountains. The boulders on each mountain in the horizon were faded a light blue, a result of the blue sky and the white snow. The surface of each mountain was entirely white, with green trees staining the white mountain and sprouting up from the ground. The snow was all untouched, as the mountains were not, were not ski mountains, they were just normal mountains. It was one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen. A view, plucked from a movie, something that seemed unreal, like a Yosemite wallpaper on MacBook Pros. I took in the remarkable scenery, then began. I cut through the immense dry powder, feeling all the snow gracefully collide with my body and legs as my skis carved my path, creating two impressions which trailed behind me, telling all future skiers, Henry squandered my resources before you could get here. Each turn I made favored a wave. Each turn I made forced a wave of white fluff to gently fly to the side. It was sensational. It was a satiable feeling, knowing now that the day was finally a success. We departed the feeling that what could have been an amazing day at Alta was not a good day at Snowbird. This day was officially epic. 
It was one of our best days of skiing. At one point, I flew off a big cliff, and for a brief moment, I was petrified. Yes, I thought I would die. But then, I was just flying, just another fellow snowbird, soaring through the crisp air of the Wasatch Mountain Range in Utah. I crashed into the deep white powder, powder of nature's secretions, creating a white cloud of snow, which enveloped my figure as my skis continued. Ahead of me, I looked for future cliffs, but unfortunately, everything was so white that I could not distinguish a mogul from a cliff, because everything was just white. I looked behind me to find my brother and father both enthralled by their landscape, pleasantly lost in their assimilation into this natural nirvana. Dad was clearly staring at the immediate terrain in front of him, clearly in awe with the snow, but still struggling to manage to clearly in awe with the snow, but still struggling to focus on the entirely white surface. Graham was not looking down, but up at the horizon. Like me, he was taking in the beautiful panorama of the mountains in the distance. But the beauty did not fade, for with every second, both Graham and my father were becoming more captivated and engrossed. We continued discussing the epicness of that run for about two minutes, waiting on the lift line at the bottom of the mountain. We skied that lift until it closed, completing about five more runs. As the day went on, however, the runs became less amazing. As more skiers came to discover and deplete our pure basin's untampered surface. Nevertheless, each run was marvelous. Epilogue Do you think we would die if we fell from here? Joseph asked, pointing towards the powdery ground. No, we wouldn't, I assured him. We definitely wouldn't. There's too much powder, and we're only about 50 feet high, I paused, then said. The Sunnyside Quad doesn't get high enough, reassuring myself. A few moments later. Several moments later, approaching the end of the lift, we were about 10 feet high. I grabbed him by the jacket and pulled him out of the lift with me. We landed in several feet of powder, laughing.